provides us with an abundance of materials. Some useful, some not very useful. But there are not enough of the useful things to go round, and some of them don't occur naturally on the earth at all. The chemist's job is to change plentiful materials into things we need, and to do so as efficiently as possible, so that many people can enjoy the fruits of his skill. This is one of the places where it's done, one of the factories of ICI at Sevenside near Bristol, where the main products are those compounds of nitrogen which are essential to grow our food. Until the beginning of this century, most of the nitrogen taken out of the soil went back again. But as the population grew and moved into cities with their improved sanitation, and more and more of our nitrogen compounds were lost by burning or by washing away down the rivers and sewers into the sea, so it became necessary to replace this lost nitrogen if people were to have enough food. Nitrogen is plentiful enough in the atmosphere and the problem was to convert this into a form which plants could use and, of course, at a price the farmer could afford. The most important way, and one which is carried out here at the rate of a thousand tons a day, was to react the nitrogen with hydrogen to form ammonia, which is then easily made into ammonium salts for spreading on the land. All this sounds simple enough, but how would you set about doing it? If we mix hydrogen and nitrogen under ordinary conditions, very little happens. If we heat them up to a high temperature, they react all right to form ammonia, but then ammonia decomposes to give us back our hydrogen and nitrogen. Eventually, there's no further change. Equilibrium is reached, and we may find that there is precious little ammonia in our product. This mightn't matter on a small scale in the laboratory, but when 1% less yield means a loss of many tons, the position of equilibrium has to be taken very seriously. Before a vast plant like this can be designed, we must know how to make the reaction go and the conditions for the best yield of products. One very expensive way would be to build many plants and choose the best. A more sensible way would be to carry out many experiments on a smaller scale and hope that we hit on the best conditions in one of them. But the best method of all is to understand the theory of chemical equilibrium and change and to calculate precisely the conditions which are best for the process we have in mind. For a chemical reaction to go as we want it to go, two conditions must be satisfied. First, it must go in the right direction, and secondly, it must go at a convenient rate. With this mechanical uh, system, this matchbox, for example, uh, there is a tendency to fall to a more stable position, like that, but it doesn't actually do so unless I give it a little encouragement, a little energy to help it. And the same is true of a chemical system like this mixture of hydrogen and oxygen in this bottle. Not in a million years will any noticeable reaction to form water occur unless I give it a little encouragement, in this case, supplying energy from a match, when it goes extremely rapidly. In fact, inconveniently so, and any factory that carried out a process like that on a large scale would have a pretty serious staffing problem. Well, thermodynamics tells us nothing about the rate of change, but it does tell us about the direction and how far the change will go in that direction. We know that a change goes in the direction of increasing disorder or entropy of everything that's concerned in the change. But entropy can't go on increasing forever. It must eventually reach a limit. And this limit of entropy, this limit of disorder, is what we call equilibrium. Equilibrium is not really a state of inactivity. It's a state of balance. If we have uh, ice and water together at atmospheric pressure, then they can exist in equilibrium at one temperature only, 0 degrees centigrade. And in this condition of equilibrium, one must think of the little molecules coming off the a solid ice into the water, other molecules going from the water back to the solid ice, but in equal numbers, so there's a balance and there's no overall change. But if I raise the temperature very slightly, then the ice 
pr melting process will win. If I drop the temperature slightly, the freezing process will win. And so, in an equilibrium situation like this, by changing very, very slightly the conditions, I can reverse the direction of reaction. A reaction which occurs at equilibrium is called reversible. In principle, any kind of change can be made reversible, even something as irreversible, apparently, as the mixing of two liquids. I'm going to mix two liquids in this vessel here, uh, and I can mix by turning the inner cylinder like this. The liquid I have in here is a very viscous one. It could be treacle. It's glycerol, so that the spontaneous uh, mixing processes due to the thermal motion of the molecules are made very slow. Now, into this vessel, I'm going to put another liquid, which is a red dye, by putting it right in here, and I'm going to push it out like this into a line, and I'm going to make a little wiggle here as I pull it out, so, and now I have a pattern there, which, because it's a viscous liquid, isn't moving. Now, if I stir, I shall destroy this pattern. I shall mix, like this, and the pattern goes. Now, what if I reverse that process of stirring? Will it come back? Will I unmix? Yes, I do. Because, you see, the mixing process was reversible. I applied just the tiniest little force to turn it in that direction, or the tiniest little force to bring it back again. At any moment, I can reverse the direction of the force and so reverse the direction of mixing. To make a chemical change go reversibly, we must apply some constraint from outside, such as a force or a pressure or an electrical potential, which will tend to make the reaction go in the opposite direction. Here is a very well-known spontaneous reaction, the dissolving of a metal zinc in an acid to give hydrogen. according to the equation which I've written on the board here. Since any acid will do, it's, we might as well write it more generally as zinc plus hydrogen ions gives zinc ions plus hydrogen. Now that's a spontaneous reaction, but how can we make it go reversibly? How can we control it? Well, one thing that immediately occurs to one is that electricity is involved. Electrical charges are transferred. So perhaps if we can oppose the reaction with an electric potential, we can control it. Now to do this, let's split the reaction into two parts, because it's really a transfer of two electrons from zinc to give zinc ions, and two electrons to the hydrogen ions to give hydrogen. These two half reactions can be carried out in separate uh, parts of the reaction vessel, which I have here. Here is the zinc metal in contact with zinc ions. And here is hydrogen, which I'm bubbling through uh, this electrode here, into hydrogen ions, into an acid solution. And just to get them nicely into contact, we have a, a bit of platinum surface, platinum metal, which doesn't take part in the reaction, but helps, uh, helps it along. And the two halves of the vessel are put into contact uh, so that ions can flow between them with this little bridge of salt. But nothing happens at the moment because the zinc builds up a negative charge on it and the hydrogen electrode a positive charge and that stops the reaction. But if I connect these two electrodes together now to allow the charge to flow from one electrode to another, then the reaction will start and indeed I shall see as I connect the two electrodes to this little galvanometer, I shall see a kick to the right showing that current is flowing. Now we're under better control, because suppose I put a potential across here in the opposite direction to which it's flowing at the moment. I can do that from another battery, and I've connected this battery across a wire, a potentiometer, so that I can pick off any amount of the voltage that I like, and I'm now going to connect one end of the wire to the galvanometer, and the other one 
I'm going to pick up the other end, I'm going to, the other electrode, I'm going to make contact with the wire. And as I do so, down here, you see, I get a kick to the left down here and a kick to the right here. Here the reaction is going in the same direction as before. Here it's going in the opposite direction. And if I take some point in between, if I slide this along the wire like this, I will eventually bring the, the potential down to a point where no current is flowing in either direction. My reaction is completely balanced. I have equilibrium. The reaction is reversible. So, by choosing the potential, I can make the reaction go either way, or I can stop it altogether. When the potential is high enough to drive the reaction backwards, hydrogen is consumed and zinc metal is deposited. This we call electrolysis. Here is a slightly different example of electrolysis. In the cell, I have a solution of zinc bromide. And I'm going to pass, a, uh, there are two inert electrodes of platinum, and I'm going to pass a current through. This is the anode, this is the cathode, and you see immediately on the anode, bromine is deposited, the yellow uh, bromine liquid, and on the cathode, you see zinc crystals beginning to grow. We're making the metal zinc in this way from its salt, and this is an example of an extremely important type of industrial process, the process by which metals such as sodium, potassium, magnesium, and aluminium are manufactured. So, we've been able to make a spontaneous reaction go backwards. Does this mean that our law of increasing entropy has also been reversed? No, of course it doesn't. It was only the entropy of the reaction itself which decreased, and the entropy of the rest of the universe, the uh, battery which was driving the reaction, of course increased, and the total entropy increased. But it's a little bit tedious and inconvenient always to do our bookkeeping by thinking of the rest of the universe, of the surroundings. Isn't there some quantity which refers just to the reaction which we can use to tell us about the direction of change? Well, there is, and this quantity is the maximum available work. We've already derived a relationship which tells us that the maximum work which we can get out of a reaction, which goes reversibly, is equal to the temperature times the increase in entropy of the system, or reaction, minus the increase in energy. Now, I want to change this slightly because a little bit of this work isn't very much use to us. It's the work which is done against the atmosphere if there's a volume change. And this will be equal to the pressure times the increase in volume. And I'm going to take that out of both sides because it's not of, of interest or use to us. And if I take it from the maximum uh, work, I should be left with just the maximum useful work, which is what we want to talk about. Now, this is the work which is done by the reaction, by the system. I want to talk about the work which is done on the system, so I can do that if I put a minus sign there, but then, of course, I must put, I must change the signs on the other side of the equation, and I will do that. And now one other small change to make things simpler. I'm going to lump these two together because they're both energies and call them energy and give them the symbol H. And this then will be called delta H and H is often called the heat content. So this now says that it's equal to delta H, the increase in heat content, minus T delta S. Now this is an extremely important quantity. It is the part of the energy which is available to do work, which is free to do work. This is the total energy, this is the free energy. And because it's so important, we give it a special symbol, G, after Gibbs, that great pioneer of thermodynamics, it's often called the Gibbs free energy. And we have that the increase in free energy, the increase in energy free to do work, is in equal to the increase in heat content or total energy minus the temperature times the increase in entropy. 
Examples of energy which are pure free energy are potential energy, the kinetic energy of a body in motion, and electrical energy, volts times coulombs. The whole of this energy can be used to do work. On the other hand, heat energy and chemical energy, which has associated disorder with it, is only partly available for doing work. Now, the free energy change immediately tells us which way a reaction will go spontaneously. We know that if a reaction can go spontaneously, it can be made to do work, and if it can be made to do work, then its free energy must decrease. So at constant temperature and pressure, if a reaction goes spontaneously, the free energy will decrease. And when the free energy is a minimum, that is the condition of equilibrium. Now you see that the free energy is made up of two terms. And if the free energy decreases, this can, be, this can occur either by a decrease in the total energy or by an increase in the entropy. So that we really have two terms working in, working in opposition and the two terms work together to give the net decrease in free energy which must occur if the reaction is to go spontaneously. It's rather like what happens on a double-decker bus. If one climbs to the upper deck, then one needs energy to do so. But when one gets there, one finds more space, more arrangements, more seats. Upstairs, therefore, has not only a higher energy, but also a higher entropy than downstairs. And the passengers distribute themselves so as to achieve a balance, an equilibrium between these two factors. A balance which depends on the number of seats or arrangements and on the energy of the passengers. Here is another illustration of an equilibrium which is a balance between energy and, and entropy terms. The position of minimum energy is when all the balls are down here. The position of maximum entropy is when they're equally distributed between the low and high energy positions. But the position of balance, of equilibrium, which is actually taken up, is neither of these extremes, but something intermediate between them. The position of an equilibrium depends upon temperature, and we can see from our equation that it's the entropy term which increases when the temperature increases. So at higher temperatures, the entropy, entropy becomes more and more important until eventually it's predominant. This is why we cook things by heating them up to break them up, uh, make them more tender, and a bad cook can probably spread the entropy all over the house. Let's take a simpler example of a molecule which can break into two atoms like this. The position of lowest energy is when they're combined, and the position of highest entropy is when they're free to move around independently of each other. Now I'm going to put these into a vessel and heat them up. A number of molecules of this kind heat them up by giving them kinetic energy. So, and you see, as I do so, some of the molecules break up, some, uh, some of the atoms recombine, and I get an equilibrium. And if I reach a higher temperature, like this, then I get almost complete dissociation. Dropping the temperature again, I get an intermediate position where some of the molecules are... Uh, 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 some of the atoms are combined, some of the molecules are dissociated. Some reactants and some products are present in equilibrium with each other, and this is always the case at equilibrium although the amount may be small. For example, in the equilibrium between hydrogen, oxygen, and water, it's way over on the water side, so much so that if equi equilibrium were established over the whole of the Atlantic Ocean, we should only have, on the average, five hydrogen molecules above it. It's important to know the proportion of reactants and products at equilibrium so as to see whether it's feasible to try to manufacture a substance in this way. If we have a simple reaction of A turning into B, then the ratio of the concentration of the products to the concentration of the reactants is what we call the equilibrium constant. And this, it's very useful to know. 
Now, another reason why the free energy is such an important quantity is that it's related in a very simple way to this equilibrium constant. In fact, this is the relation delta G, the increase in free energy, is minus RT log K, where R is the gas constant, and this is true, providing the free energies are measured in standard concentration states, and that's what that little naught there means. Now, free energies can be looked up in tables in almost any good library, and with a little simple arithmetic, one can calculate for any change that we're interested in, the free energy change. And so we can calculate K and see whether the proportion of products at equilibrium is high enough to make it feasible and sensible to begin thinking about carrying out a process on this scale. In the manufacture of ammonia from hydrogen and nitrogen, for example, we obviously want the equilibrium to be well over on the side of ammonia. There are simple rules which can be applied to tell us that we should work at high pressure and low temperature to get the best yield of ammonia. But we can now do much better than this. And we can calculate from the free energy change of the reaction exactly what proportion of ammonia we shall have in our vessel under any particular equilibrium conditions. And we can plot uh, the, the results on a graph like this, the percentage ammonia against the pressure for various temperatures and read it off. Of course, we have to make sure that the reaction goes rapidly enough. And this means in practice using catalysts and working at a higher temperature than we would have chosen on purely equilibrium gap grounds. Like most things in life, the final design is a compromise. And the problem of finding the best compromise is made very much easier if we know how to apply to it the science of thermodynamics. In this particular plant, the compromise chosen is at this point on the graph, at a pressure of 350 atmospheres, a temperature of 500 degrees and a yield which at equilibrium will be about 30% of ammonia. We began by seeing how all spontaneous changes go in a certain direction, the direction of increasing entropy of everything and of de decreasing free energy of the system itself until equilibrium is reached. We also saw that any spontaneous process can be made to do work for us. And this is very useful. But now we've seen that if we're prepared to do work on the reaction, we can drive it backwards in the direction opposite to that of spontaneous change. And this is also useful since it enables us to make substances which we need, but which are not formed spontaneously. It's just as well that it is possible to drive reactions backwards in this way, otherwise we ourselves should not be here. The whole of biological growth, of evolution, and the increasing order of societies and civilizations is a process of decreasing entropy in the living system itself. But this doesn't contradict our laws of disorder because we are not an isolated system. We depend on the abundant free energy of the sun, which is bestowed upon us as the universal driving force of our existence. Only by its power can we live our precarious lives far from the limits of disorder and the equilibrium products, carbon dioxide and water, to which, if left to ourselves, we should so spontaneously and rapidly return. <laughs>